everybody. Welcome to another Live Street Fishery Bite podcast, and today I'm joined by Professor Robin Faith Walsh. And today we're going to be discussing her course with MythVision Myth, with Myth Vision podcast titled The Gospel Masterclass, Understanding the Gospels as Literature. You can see in the bottom here, here in the bottom bar there, it says purchase the course. The link to purchase the course is in the description below, in the History Valley affiliate link to MythVision podcast. So we'll check that out. And that being said, uh, welcome back to History Valley, Dr. Walsh. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you uh, talking to me about the class and giving me this opportunity. Thank you for coming on. So can you tell us what this course is about? Well, um, it's kind of following up on the Paul class that we talked about a while back. Uh, it seemed like a good idea if we're going to go through the life and history and letters of Paul to then move on to the Gospels. So it's a bit of a chronological take on that first and second century world in which early Christianity emerges. We talk mostly in the course. I, I'm talking to Derek Lambert um, throughout throughout the class, and we have some interview material as well as part of this. But I try to locate the Gospels and the Gospel authors in that first and second century context. And we do it through a number of methods. One is to talk about literary borrowings from the Gospel authors. We all know about the Hebrew Bible being something that is obviously at the foundation of what the Gospel authors are presenting. They're very um, keen on explicating the Hebrew Bible and uh, Jewish holy books in order to explain um, the rationale and life of Jesus uh, as Messiah. But I think generally uh, less appreciated, although, you know, scholarship obviously treats this quite often, um, and we review some of that, is the literary uh, influences on the gospel authors as these Mediterranean writers who are part of a more elite cultural class, um, you might say, of people in the ancient world with the education to read and write, but those literary uh, influences on them that maybe they learned in school, so things like Homer, here the work of someone like Dennis McDonald, I think will come to mind for many of your viewers. Um, also, I actually argue that Virgil is an influence as well, because many of these authors were what we might call bi or trilingual in the ancient world. They're clearly reading the epics. Um, they've, again, probably been taught this at school. Uh, they're referencing things like the Greek novel because this is an era in which you do have more people interested in books and book culture, and they're engaging that. And so we have the emergence of things like the Greek novel. Um, there already exists many what we would call lives or biographies of ancient people who are notable. So philosophers, generals, emperors, <laughs> uh, great teachers and holy men. It's within that ambit of literature, and so I tried to do a deep dive into that kind of comparative method, talk a little bit about what education would have looked like in the ancient world. I also talk about what that audience might have been like, and so one thing I do is think hypothetically, um, but grounded in scholarship and some numbers on how many people are we actually talking about who are writing and circulating these texts. So it's uh, chronological in the sense that we start with Mark and we move forward. We talk about the influence of Paul on the Gospels. And so you really see that trajectory. And then again, think about these writers in their historical and cultural moment. What's influencing them? How have they been educated? How are they putting together this pe these pieces of literature uh, within that context, not only for the usual purposes we talk about theologically, that they want to maybe preserve oral speech. We challenge oral tradition a little bit in this course. We talk about the hypothetical Q document as this quote unquote, again, source for many of the teachings of Jesus and many of the ideas we have about his life. But we talk about uh, a different way to kind of imagine the motivations of these writers as writers. So they're not just writing for the preserv preservation of the historical Jesus or um, oral tradition, that kind of thing, but writing in order to compete in a landscape, you know, not to make it <laughs> too capitalist sounding, um, but compete in a landscape where you had to show your bona fides. You had to show, in other words, that uh, what you're writing is worth reading when compared to other offerings at the time. And so I think it's a little bit of a different take than the usual kind of gospel course um, that you might expect that just sort of goes through each author, when, why, where, how, we do that too, but try to make it a little bit more complex within that kind of cultural moment and that um, overarching interest and placing them in their historical context. 
We have a super chat question from Michael E. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your super chat. If gospels are simply the products of literary mimesis, myth making, cultural diffusion, and forgery, why should anyone read them? Hashtag disenchanted. Well, at this period, especially post Jewish war, and I we actually I think talked about this last time I was um, on <laughs> your show a little bit, um, but. The Jewish War happens in 70, which, you know, becomes this big marker for the Gospels, right? We, we can tell through various contextual clues within the text itself that these authors are aware that that war happened. The war in Judea was a, a major inflection point, not only, obviously, for the Judean people, uh, for the Jewish people, and then later what's going to become Christianity, but for the Romans as well, the Roman world. We know leading up to that war that people are interested in, let's call it Judean stuff. The books of the Judean people, of the Jewish people, these holy books, what we would call the Hebrew Bible, for example, uh, is much older than anything else that the Romans have, even with the Greek culture that they so admire. And they are aware of this. There's also associations between the, obviously because of the Exodus, the Jewish people and Egypt, which some scholars call the first and second centuries the period of Egyptomania. And we know that Egypt uh, looms large in cultural imagination because of the archeology, span even just in Rome, for example. Uh, you have all these obelisks everywhere. Maybe if you've been to Rome, you can see they're now often in sort of like little town centers or not like neighborhood centers. You'll see an obelisk randomly like in front of a church. If you see the Vatican, there are obelisks in front of it there. Those were all imported from Egypt. We even have examples of Roman generals who, when they build tombs for themselves in Egypt, build pyramids. And Augustus, who was emperor when Jesus was actually born, the first Roman emperor, he's obsessed with it too. Um, he is the one who defeats Cleopatra and Mark Antony. And so he wants to show the obelisk and this um, sort of cultural domination of Egyptian stuff, but this interest in this ancient Egyptian material within the city of Rome and as part of his campaigns as well. This carries forward in the first and second centuries. And again, because the texts of the Hebrews, this wisdom literature as well, is more ancient than any of these other things. It's associations with what's already kind of hot in the cultural moment. And then this major conflict where the Jewish temple is destroyed, the, the spoils from destroying that temple are marched through the streets of Rome. The money from that battle is used to build what we call today the Colosseum. It was known back then as the Flavian Amphitheater. But that building, which becomes like the Super Bowl center of ancient Rome, that was built from the spoils of the Jewish war. Uh, then you have things like the Arch of Titus. Uh, you have all this minted on coins. I mean, there was, there was this great interest in this period in Jewish stuff. Uh, I think I've mentioned before, um, either on this podcast or elsewhere, that we also know, you know, whether or not it's completely true, we do have legal codes from this period that say that some Jewish people, Judeans, they're referred to in the text, um, are actually in trouble because they claim that they're dream interpreters and they're charging people money to interpret dreams, but they're doing it through these holy books. When you think about Paul in context, that's exactly what he's doing. He's using the Hebrew Bible to interpret for Gentiles, so for non-Jews, a way for them to understand how they can have membership in this group um, where you have Jesus of Nazareth as Jewish Messiah. But remember, Paul doesn't care that much actually about the historical Jesus. By the time you get to post-war, when there's all of this interest, you know, because of the conflict, because of all the reasons that I just said, you have uh, what emerges in the Gospels, an example of a great teacher uh, who is very, very knowledgeable of these ancient Jewish texts, who is also this underdog figure at a time when those kinds of biographies are also popular. Think of someone like Aesop, the life of Aesop. He's also another underdog figure. Alexander Romance, which is a tale about Alexander the Great, but turns him into an underdog. There's sort of this rooting for the underdog thing going on, <laughs> coupled with this interest in uh, Judea in Jewish literature, and Jesus actually collapses all of that <laughs> into one kind of text that is both biography, which people are interested in, but also has, especially with something like the Gospel of Luke, these elements of the Greek novel, also popular at the time. And another genre that I think is influential is paradoxography, uh, which basically means wonder tales. And when you think about what Jesus is doing in the text, it's nothing but one wonder after another. 
whether it's a healing or, you know, uh, an exorcism or uh, some kind of, uh, Patton Oswalt calls them lunch miracles, you know, <laughs> um, making, uh, you know, water turn into wine or, you know, multiplying loaves and fishes. Um, so I think that combination, it's harder for us to see it now, obviously, because um, we think of it in just purely religious terms. But I think if a non-Jew encountered this kind of material, a Gentile, um, there would be a lot of reasons to be interested in it beyond just membership within a Christian group. Of course, that's part of it. And I talk about that in the course as well. But this is going back to really thinking about the historical moment. What are some other threads that we can identify and pull on to understand why uh, somebody would be interested in, in these things without just that religious motivation? So the question's an excellent one. Um, it's something I spent a lot of time thinking about, but we try to get at it in the course. Could you talk about um, some specific examples of how the Gospels are like Greco-Roman literature? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are a lot. <laughs> and one thing I want to caution um, right off the bat is that I try to be really careful uh, in my scholarship in this course to not try to posit that every single thing I can think of means that the gospel authors were doing all of these things or reading everything that I reference. So I want to talk in a little bit broader and broader terms in that respect, because I don't want to necessarily say I know for sure the gospel writers were reading X, Y, and Z, even when it comes to each other or the letters of Paul, they may have only had portions of it. What I see are more literary um, influences and trajectories that I think are common across literature. So some of those include things like uh, having a symposium, uh, which in other words, a meal. I'm just kind of randomly uh, off the top of my head. That kind of sympotic, we call it, um, scenes, th those are very, very common across novels, across epics. Um, you see them all over the place. And so you have something like that, obviously, with The Last Supper, not just the fact that The Last Supper takes place, but the way that it's contextualized. Uh, I talk in my book, actually, about something um, called the Satyricon, where you have many motifs that are very, very common to paradoxography and to the Greek novel that you see in this, some people say, late first, early second century text, including crucifixion scenes. There's one crucifixion scene with three men being crucified on a cross, being guarded by a Roman soldier. And the Roman soldier goes into a tomb for a symposium scene and also some hanky-panky with a Roman widow, but uh, goes in for three days and three nights and leaves an empty tomb and a man comes down off the cross. His family comes and takes him off the cross. Uh, so those motifs are common. Things like uh, cocks crowing before somebody dies. We also see that in the Satyricon, but it also happens with the death of other philosophers in antiquity. Uh, there are cases, obviously, in the Gospels of Jesus healing. Many of those healings are things you'll find in accounts of Asclepius, the healing god, um, the pan-Mediterranean healing god at the time. And you also have in stories of philosophers, ideas of teachers and students. So here's John the Baptist and Jesus. And I think we can securely say that the uh, entire arc of the Gospels really mirrors in terms of character development and Jesus as that central figure, the kind of treatment that you see in something like the epics. Um, and so again, I'll talk about Dennis McDonald here or refer to Dennis McDonald, who's done quite a bit on that mimesis thesis, demonstrating that Homer is probably in view in terms of how you know Jesus is characterized in the Gospels, described the events that take place. Um, I, I'll say that uh, <laughs> I, I think sometimes, again, we can overdetermine these things um, and, and want to be careful, but unlike uh, some of those broader categories that I've referenced, I think in the case of Homer, we can be pretty sure that the gospel writers went to school and were taught Homer, <laughs> right? So when we see those comparisons with Homer, we can be more secure too that that is in view of the gospel authors because that's how they've learned to read and write. And so all of that combined again with the paradoxographical text where you also have things like miraculous healings, but also stories of, you know, resurrections, um, that sort of thing. Uh, there are so many comparisons, it's actually hard to really nail it down. But you can see in that kind of field how the gospels slot themselves in very securely with the literary interests of the time period. Are each of the Gospels 
similar to Greco-Roman literature in different ways? That's a really great question. Um, yes, I would just uh, obviously this is me <laughs> um, but i think this is backed up um, both by things that i've written and uh, other scholars and uh, there is a bibliography associated with the course that gets into some of this mark i would say reminds me much more of paradoxography i say that because of the level of the greek which i think gets a little bit too much grief i think that mark uh, is doing a fairly good job uh, with his characterization with his structure of the tale even if his vocabulary is perhaps somewhat limited but you see that in paradoxography as well so the sort of uh, construction of vignettes is also something that you see in paradoxography and then obviously um, there have been many scholars who have written about how Mark is an ancient biography. I think that that's generally the case, although I would give it again that kind of um, side note that in this period there are a lot of biographies about underdog figures. And I think you have that going on with Mark as well. Matthew takes Mark and really uh, tries to add to it more references to the Hebrew scriptures you have, as it is written quite a bit in Matthew, or contextualization, more explication of the teachings that you find in Mark. Also, Matthew seems less happy with exorcisms and demons and that sort of thing. And so often you see that kind of stripped away from Matthew. Uh, Matthew is usually associated with, um, you know, some people call it like the, the Jewish gospel, meaning that it makes all of these references to the Hebrew Bible. It's why it's the first book when you open up the New Testament, because there are, you know, you start off right away with a genealogy that you can trace going back to what is usually called the Old Testament in the Bible. Um, it, you know, you finish that part of the Bible and then you open up and you have right away uh, an introduction to the relevance for the New Testament of everything that you've found in the so-called Old Testament. Um, but I would also say Matthew has a lot more philosophy that's overt. I think Mark is also functioning with a kind of understanding of the cosmos and an understanding of what we would call physics that you also find in Paul among the middle Platonists is uh, what we call this era of philosophers who are interested in the ethics of Plato, but the physics of the Stoics, you see that in Mark as well. Mark is, to my mind, clearly reading some of the letters of Paul so that makes its way into Matthew, but Matthew also um, intensifies some of this kind of philosophical and ethical reflection. You see this, for example, with the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is very much presented as a new Moses. When he gives uh, his Sermon on the Mount, it is basically the law, but he says that he's there to intensify the law. And so he brings this sort of rereading of the Jewish whole books uh, as this new Moses, but does it with that ethical bent that you can see some of the influences of Stoicism. Luke is very much to me, especially if you think that the author of Acts is also Luke. Some people dispute this, but in either case, I do think you can make the claim that Luke looks much more like the Greek novel. It's much more dramatic. Uh, it has songs in it. <laughs> it has uh, the more traditional sort of dramatic elements that we associate with the nativity story. Um, you know, you do have a baby Jesus in Matthew as well, but, you know, because Mark just starts with the baptism, no information on Jesus before that. But Luke is the one that really gives us that um, very dramatic scene with more cosmological elements to it um, as well. Uh, you have more references to natural phenomena. You have some references to cosmic events in that text. Um, but you have things that you just don't have uh, in terms of character development and travel and um, just more of a dramatic arc than you have in the other two, even if you have similar teachings and events that take place. If you think that Luke also authored Acts of the Apostles, you have a shipwreck. Very common for the Greek novel <laughs> to have a shipwreck. That's usually how the star-crossed lovers are separated. Uh, there's a shipwreck somewhere or pirates or something like that. Um, so Luke seems to be aware of this and is uh, very much writing kind of that novel-esque epic that we've been talking about. Um, there's a book by someone named Marianne Palmer Bonds. It's about 20 years old now. Um, it's the only book I think she ever wrote. I think she exited the field, um, but it was a very interesting book at Fortress Press called Luke Ac Acts as Epic, uh, which really goes through and shows how Luke is engaging that kind of 
epic narrative with that interest in, you know, novelistic themes. John is always difficult to place, right, because it has um, so many of these theological statements. I don't see those as incongruous to what you see actually in Paul, um, especially in the way that the, again, cosmology is sort of mapped out. One thing that happens to, to John, and I think one reason it can be difficult to locate, is that it has a little bit of disjo disjointed feel to it. Sometimes we have some passages um, that were appearing in other gospels as kind of like in the margins and people like those stories and they sort of made their way into John because it is a little disjointed. Despite the fact that it has that kind of pastiche feel to it, um, it very much seems to me like the kind of text that is trying to bring in those grander statements about the nature of Christ, about um, the coming kingdom, those kinds of elements. So a real theological reading, we might say, uh, into that core gospel story. And if we understand John as being the later gospel, possibly second century, uh, some people would even date all the gospels to the second century. But if John is that later gospel, you can understand how it's reflecting a more developed, at that point, theology. Um, and so that's how I would generally characterize at least the canonical gospels and then you have a wide variety with the non-canonical as well. Michael E, thank you for your super chat. Why should anyone read them in 2024? That's an awesome question. <laughs> and that's why I do <laughs> any of these kinds of appearances um, because people weaponize them um, and have interpretations that you know, interpretation can shift and there's a debate to be had about whether or not the original intentions of an author matter um, or whether the uh, original quote unquote interpretation of a text and its intentions matter to the extent that people use the New Testament in general, the Gospels, the Bible as a reason to dictate to other people how to live their lives, how to feel, how to treat one another. We need to read and reread these texts, but I think understand them in their first and second century context so that we can see that we give these texts authority. They claim authority, but we don't have to necessarily use them in the way that they're used today. We can be more flexible in our understanding of the purpose and context of these texts. And uh, I think sometimes we need to really understand that some of our interpretations, I'm thinking off the top of my head here about Romans 1, uh, using that um, against people who um, are part of the LGBTQ community, for example. Paul is talking about something else <laughs> in Romans 1 principally. Uh, he's talking about a variety of different stereotypes about Gentiles, and he lists that one among a number of others. But people will use these texts, um, and I should go back to the Gospels, but that was just the one that was off the top of my head, that, that people use um, to control one another. And so for that reason, I think that we should reread Paul, but also the Gospels, and try to have a more generous reading, try to have a more accepting reading um, of these texts, try to understand them in their original context, and really uh, think about their development and what they are claiming. And uh, part of that too is trying to understand that the gospels are written much later than the life of the so-called historical Jesus. They're written uh, maybe two generations later to understand that the gospel authors are A, not witnesses, B, that history writing in antiquity is different from how we understand it today all of those things, I think, can help us have a more generous understanding of the purpose of these texts and how we relate to one another. Also, they're kind of cool. <laughs> Beyond all the ethical imperative stuff, if you read them uh, and really think about what's going on there with Jesus, like talking to demons and putting them into pigs and throwing them into, you know, like a sea, like all of that is pretty rad, actually. And so I like it for that, too. <laughs> Pedro, thank you for your super sticker. I appreciate it. Michael Beverly, thank you for your super chat. When I mention Homer, Christians push back like I'm insane. Is this idea, and it makes perfect sense to me, gaining popularity? I think it's something that someone like Dennis mcdonald has been trying to argue basically his whole career. I think someone like Mimi Palmer Bonds picked up on this too. Um, and so, 
there was a groundswell, I would say, like 20 years ago. Not that people didn't recognize this before, but I hope that it keeps gaining steam. And maybe it's just that, you know, these are scholarly circles generally where these conversations are happening. And that's why I think it's important for more and more scholars to make scholarship, um, but also, you know, these kinds of uh, spaces where we debate these issues and talk about the text available to more people just because you don't or can't pay for college tuition <laughs> shouldn't mean that you can't, you know, access these ideas. I think it is gaining more steam as people talk more and more about book culture in the ancient Mediterranean. And I think there's a real move towards that now. I'm thinking about the work, um, not only of Dennis McDonald, but someone like Candida Moss, she has a book coming out, I think in March, um, called God's Ghostwriters that talks about this as well. Brent Nongbri had a book that came out um, a few years ago with Yale University Press called God's Library that talks about the nature of our documents and the manuscripts from which we compile something like the Gospels. I think it's important to look at all of this and then to understand that comparative landscape we've been talking about, including Homer. And the more we talk about book culture, this will happen in part because of the piece of, about education I was just referencing. We have what's called uh, scolia, which are, you know, notations in different texts. Um, and we also have evidence from um, school uh, context, what's called paideia, of the different kinds of exercises that people um, would engage to learn, you know, like we would call curricula. Like we, we know how people were learning and almost everybody learned from Homer. So it totally makes sense that if you're going to quote unquote fill in the blanks for a character that you're writing in a story uh, and you're missing some details because it's, you know, your mark writing in 70 at the earliest and Jesus died, you know, 40 years ago, there is no problem in antiquity really in the sense that we might think of it today with literally supplying some details that will be signals for your reader that they're gonna be familiar with from places like the epics, like Homer, to understand the importance, the significance, um, the dramatic turn that you're trying to represent in your own writing. Uh, and this happens in literature all the time. So I think the less we think of the gospels as sort of isolated texts that you know have this unique genre, we call them gospels as if they're their own genre classification when really they look like many other kinds of writing in the first and second century as we've been talking about. The less we isolate them, the more we realize that uh, it's not just about recording some kind of religious fervor or again, oral tradition, but it's about engaging that long tradition of foundational stories of epic of biography um, that you know everybody's gonna know Homer. And I think that more and more we're realizing not just at the level of literary comparison, but at the level of that context of book culture, paideia and learning, of course, this is exactly where they're going to go. When you look at the book of Acts, would you say that the book of Acts is parallels Greco-Roman literature in different ways from the Gospels? Acts is more of a narrative about Paul. It does mention Jesus, obviously, but it, it's more like a travel story, obviously, in contrast to the Gospels. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, it, it is very dramatic. <laughs> Um, it has those elements like you're talking about. Um, it reminds me where the, I mean, really the shipwreck is the thing, but it also has like dramatic prison escapes. Um, you also encounter the kind of conflict that I think is really representative of the historical landscape we've been talking about in the sense that, um, especially, you know, you like you say, it's really about Paul. But, you know, he'll run into somebody um, who, you know, is being inspired by like a snake god <laughs> and kind of like in competition with him in like a town square. Um, I love that there are like angels who come in like, you know, to rescue them and like sticky situations. I think at one point he even runs into some John the Baptist followers. That's really interesting. And I love the messiness of it, too, because it does turn it into this kind of, you know, like adventure tale. Uh, I, it reminds me a lot of something like Lucian's True Stories. Um, I do think Lucian has, you know, far more creative license, and um, you know, his satire makes it a more complex kind of narrative. But you know, in that story, kind of like with Paul, you just have this idea of moving through space 
kind of going from town to town or going from location to location and encountering all kinds of wild stuff or having these adventures or misadventures. Um, so that is, again, you know, the Greek novel almost always. It's very kind of like Shakespearean. You have two lovers, um, you know, young lovers who are interested in one another. They're torn apart for one reason um, or another. Somebody's again, like, uh, you know, I mentioned kidnapped by pirates. I think that one's in Calaroe. And uh, I was thinking about that back to the question on, you know, how does the gospel, how do the gospels engage on uh, different kinds of literary motifs that are already out there at one point in that story, um, everyone thinks that she's dead and she's buried in a tomb and her would-be boyfriend rolls back the stone of the tomb to go in to, you know, pay his respects, very Romeo and Juliet and her body's gone. It's because pirates came in and, you know, looted the place and took her captive. He doesn't know this yet. And he just assumes if her body's missing, that means she's become a god <laughs> or God has stolen her to be the god's girlfriend. And so he sort of, you know, looks up at the sky and laments the situation. And then he has to go, you know, he figures out that she's still alive and he goes, you know, hightailing after her. That kind of travelogue story, very much the novel, very much epic, like, this is what Homer's talking about. Like it's a it's a journey. It's what someone like Lucian, again, True Stories, is doing, and that's exactly what you get in Acts of the Apostles. It's all um, very very similar. John D, thank you for your super chat. Do you think we can say much about what was created by the author based on literary function? Isn't that only a sign of competence, e.g., crucifixion and Mark? Um, do you think we could say much about what was created by the author based on literary function? I'm wondering uh, if this means, I, I'm a little fuzzy on what exactly this means. Um, how much maybe is creative input from the author? That's how I'm interpreting that. You know, how much does the author kind of supply their own information? based on literary knowledge, it is a sign of competence. Um, so maybe I'll hang on on that part of the question. Um, competence in the sense that they are well-trained, that they're well-read, that they are engaging the literature of the age, that they know the kind of signposting that they have to hit on. So I'm trying to move here thinking about the crucifixion. Um, they're going to hit on something like a uh, natural phenomenon. When somebody important is born or dies in the biographical tradition, uh, especially, you usually have some kind of earthquake <laughs> or you have some kind of cataclysmic event or you have some kind of, say, like lightning strike, something natural that takes place as this marker of something significant. So I could think there um, with the passion narratives and something like Mark, where you do have that kind of, again, signposting. Um, Mark II, I've argued, understands what's called the um, Thalma tradition, Thalma meaning wonder tradition, which I think you find in the epics especially. And he takes it though and um, does something a little bit interesting with it that I actually associate with someone like Virgil where what's called in Mark, say the messianic secret, um, I think is actually a case of the reason nobody understands who Jesus is or Jesus doesn't want anybody to talk about who he is at the time. And this instills great wonder and bewilderment um, among the people who encounter him. That's the kind of thing that often happens to certain heroes within the epic tradition. And I relate that scene. Uh, I have a piece coming out in the next quest for the historical Jesus. But I relate those scenes to the scenes with Camilla in uh, Virgil. Uh, same thing, you know, she marches into town, she's this subversive figure because she's a woman, but she's also a warrior. And whenever anybody sees her, they're dumbfounded, amazed, almost go out of their minds because they can't process what they're seeing because it's so wondrous. When Jesus performs a miracle um, or talks to people, walks into town and people are amazed and dumbfounded and astounded and don't know what to make of Jesus and who is this guy, you know, before he reveals himself uh, as the Messiah in the text, you know, it's a literary function, yes. And so it shows their competence or someone like Mark's competence in engaging that kind of motif. And the effect of this is that um, you as a reader are being instructed based on that literary motif to identify with the witnesses in the text um, and to understand that those scenes are remarkable, that they're diff they have a difference. In other words, uh, Jesus 
nobody knows what to make of him and you're kind of in on it as the reader that you're also amazed dumbfounded impressed by whatever he's performing which is otherwise you know perhaps somewhat uh stretching credulity <laughs> in the sense that you know he's doing all kinds of miraculous things you may have heard about them in something like a uh, testimony from Asclepius or a biography of someone like Asclepius, but it's still kind of uh, a big ask to understand that these things are going on. So this literary, literary motif guides you as a reader through the text and tells you that, you know, these are remarkable moments and that even the people witnessing in them didn't know what to make of them, but you as the reader identify with that and go along. And that kind of skill level, I think, is there in the Gospels. Again, it's elsewhere. It's something they would have been well aware of and instructed on um, within that educational context. Let's go for the next super chat. Michael Beverly, thank you for your super chat. Would you add Richard Miller to that list, to that last list of offers you gave previously? And if you don't mind, Bayesian posterior on a historical Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, Miller's work on the empty tomb. Um, I believe that there's at least one book. I feel like there's an article too um, that Richard Miller did um, on this. I found his work really, um, I think there are two books now that I think of it. I think there are two books on uh, resurrection and an empty tomb. I found them super helpful when I was writing my own book. Um, because I think it's pretty easy to just associate, you know, the empty tomb to you know, what people call apotheosis in this period. So apotheosis being something that would happen to, say, the emperors, where uh, the idea of bodily resurrection was very, very common. It usually happened to founding figures and to heroes and then later to emperors, where, you know, the body doesn't decompose, it doesn't decay, it just goes straight up to heaven. This is precisely what happens to Jesus. Um, as I mentioned before, it happens in paradoxography, paradoxography in the novel as well. Um, what Miller was able to point out is, I think, I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, but I think the numbers are, he had something like 35 of these kinds of resurrections that already existed, including people like Romulus and Remus, if I remember correctly, um, in the Roman uh, and Greek literary tradition. Uh, and he really explicates all of this. And then I went through and I think I found a few more, <laughs> like maybe a dozen more that I talk about in the book, including the Greek novel. Um, so I think I remember bringing in the Calaroe example. And so I, I really found his work helpful. Um, some other authors that I really like is uh, somebody named Karen O'Malley. Um, her last name is, is spelled in the Gaelic way. Um, so I think it's M-H-E-A-L-L. A-I-G-H. Um, but her work on Lucian, uh, and I think Lucian's really interesting, although he's later, um, but a lot of uh, her analysis of Lucian I've found particularly helpful for thinking through the Gospels, and I've had some conversations with her, um, and I think, you know, she agrees. Um, I don't want to speak for her, but I think that she sees um, those kinds of parallels as well. Uh, Canada Moss, I mentioned before. Uh, I've talked on this podcast about Jennifer Isle. Um, I really like her work on divination uh, with Paul, but she's also done some really great theoretical work that I found useful. Erin Roberts, who has written on the Stoic influence on the Gospel of Matthew. I find her work really helpful. Obviously, Dennis McDonald. Um, I like Paula Fredrickson's work, too. Um, I think that she's done a lot of um, great contextualization and historical work in understanding these gospels, especially within the Jewish context, uh, we might say. So uh, that that group of people I find super influential and I recommend all of their work. Um, and by the way, academia.edu, a lot of these people post their work there um, and Willie Braun and Bill Arnall. So th those um, have all been big influences um, on me. Bayesian posterior on historical Jesus. I don't remember what that is. <laughs> so I don't want to ignore it. Um, but I'm not big. I know I just said I was in the next quest for the historical Jesus. And I feel bad because this is 50 bucks. Um, but why don't I, 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 I've talked to people about this uh, within the last couple of years, but I don't feel like I'm an expert enough to talk about it. So sorry about that. Dr. Andy, thank you for your super chat. When did the tendency begin to take the Bible literally? 
Who started this tradition? Was there ever a significant controversy about this issue in ancient times? Well, beginning with that last part, yeah, there's a lot of controversy. Um, one thing I'm interested in in my own research right now is looking at the second century and beyond to see non-Christians sort of complaining about having read the Gospels and being like, what is this? Thing? <laughs> um, you know, like, I, I'm reading this, I'm like going along, I'm trying to understand uh, the history of, of this group or this figure. And I think a lot of this stuff is made up. Um, <laughs> I, you know, and you have someone like Lucian who's talking out uh, in the passing of Peregrinus about this guy who is like on the lamb from the law and he keeps kind of joining gullible groups that he thinks will protect him or, you know, pay his lawyer bills. Um, and among them are the Christians. Um, so I, th I find it really interesting to look at that material uh, and see that. Um, you know, or contra calcium, you know, um, there is very much kind of skepticism um, outside of Christian circles about exactly what's being claimed by these groups. Uh, so I recommend looking at, um, you know, Celsus, looking at Lucian um, to get kind of this different perspective. I know there's some debate about whether the letters um, between Pliny and Trajan on Christians are authentic or not. I tend to think that they are. Um, I'm still in that camp. I can still be convinced otherwise, but for now I'm still convinced by that. And uh, looking at that correspondence is really interesting too, the game of telephone going on between these leaders trying to figure out what's going on with the so-called Christians in their midst. So um, I, I really like that. In terms of the tendency to take the Bible, Bible literally, uh, I think the church fathers start to maintain this early on. The important thing to keep on in mind with all of this, though, and it really, you know, comes across too again with these critiques that I was just referencing, um, is that this is all part of let's call it a contestation, but this sort of wrestling for authority. Um, somebody's work who comes to mind on this I really like is Dan Lucci who has a piece called Cat a Pac-Man. <laughs> and I think it's available on his academia.edu page. His last name is U-L-L-U-C-C-I. He wrote this piece on the second century and this idea of the gospels being anonymous, where that came from. And what you see with the church fathers is that they're all making these claims, and we might call them again, literal claims about the Bible, events that have taken place in say the gospels, etc. Um, and really sort of arguing with each other for their own authority over the interpretation or the version uh, of the gospel that they think is accurate. Some people um, have also written in recent years about this figure Marcion, uh, who had his own perspective on uh, Paul and on the gospels and on a proper interpretation of that history. So as all of that is getting sort of sussed out <laughs> in the second century, you see people making these claims about things being literally true or about the historical Jesus as part of their own sort of social contestation. And so I think understanding that context is really important um, to see that there was both controversy and sort of uh, less than, let's call them like altruistic or pure motivations for those kinds of debates. <laughs> um, people are using these gospels for their own purposes and their own sort of turf battles uh, and uh, trying to accumulate their own authority, especially as this church is developing, the so-called church is developing. So Dan Lucci's work is great um, on this issue, I think, for understanding, you know, why we think the gospels are anonymous and how they've been cited. A scholar who um, passed away a few years ago, but has a lot of material on this too, is Francois Bovan. Uh, I believe he's written on Marcion as well. And so I might go back and um, try to find some of his work uh, on these issues too. But that's when you first start seeing these claims start to emerge. What do you think caused Christians to want to write their gospels in Greco-Roman literary context? Well, that's a great question. Um, I've been researching lately um, for the book that I'm writing right now about what's going on in the first and second century in terms of a few things. Number one is you have this emergence of what the classicist David Constant called the active reader. Uh, he actually has an article on this that you may also be able to access, um, although I'll try in my next book to kind of um, summarize it uh, in a slightly different way. But um, I'll put it this way. 
during the empire, the Roman empire, um, you know, they were brutal colonialists. There's no other way to put it. Under that empire, however, you had increased trade. Uh, you've often heard, you know, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, this act uh, or, you know, this campaign of what's usually called Hellenization that took place where you had um, more ancient roadways and so more connectivity. Um, Greek becomes this, you know, when we say Koine Greek, it means common Greek. It becomes this language that you no longer have just pure regional dialects or regional languages. There's at least one language that most people can communicate in. Uh, around the empire for nothing else but economic purposes. So for trade um, or, uh, you know, it, there's increase in what, again, paideia, we call paideia. So kind of localized education, because you have more connectivity, you have more reasons to do things like write letters. Um, with trade increasing, you have people of, say, like what we would call middle class back then, you know, sub-equestrian <laughs> is how you might put it. Um, but people who are of sort of um, like the merchant classes or um, these middle classes that are people like tradesmen um, or people who are engaging in some kind of like manufacture of goods. A lot of these people, um, especially in trade cities like places, places like Ostia, um, they're making a lot more money <laughs> than they used to. Um, again, before you had the empire sort of force linking people together uh, with people under this empire becoming more prosperous, this is what you usually hear politically called the Roman peace. Again, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that these Romans were brutal dictators, but you know, putting that aside for a moment, just kind of looking at the economics, uh, you do have people who are a rising middle class because there's just more demand, you know, if we think of it in terms of supply and demand. Those people want to look like the native aristocracy. They want to look like the elites um, that were already established. They want to look like the rich. And so they're going to do things like dress a certain way. Um, if you've never read the Satyricon, go read about Trimalchio. He exactly fits this kind of bill. He was a former enslaved person who's made a lot of money. He can't read or write, but he's a giant library and he sort of does everything a little bit wrong that like a rich person would do. I think the book culture side of this really comes to the fore in that respect. You have this active reader, this emerging class of people who want to read and write because that's what you do when you're rich and fancy, right? Um, you sort of engage that intellectual culture. This is that aspirational thing that you can look up to and say that you want to be a part of. And, you know, you, you see this in other forms too, like people want to dress a certain way um, or you know, people will go to great expense to buy like knockoffs of fancy purses and things like that. You know, this is just kind of, it seems to be kind of a human social instinct to do this kind of thing. But what you have is that emerging readership that's not right in Rome, right? People write in Rome in that center. It's a pretty small world where you have like the Cicero's and the Cato's of, of um, antiquity, you know, writing and reading and hobnobbing and like going to the Senate. Those guys are writing in Latin. What you have on the outskirts of the empire are these more kind of like middle class, upper middle class people who want to, you know, emulate what they're seeing in that city center with these, you know, native aristocracy, true elites engaging in their book culture, writing their texts, debating theological and philosophical issues, but they're doing it in Greek. They're doing it on a lesser literary level. And they're doing it um, kind of in their own way on their own subject matters. They can't compete with those centralized high elite characters. So they gravitate towards other subjects or they gravitate towards other figures or they gravitate towards, as I was talking about before, the underdog. And I think that's what you're seeing with the gospels is sort of this uh, emerging new readership, uh, creating new kinds of literature in a new context. Um, and the gospels are just one form of that. But other things we've talked about like paradoxography or the Greek novel, um, cookbooks, <laughs> you get cookbooks, um, not for the first time, but you know, you start to see more of that kind of stuff um, emerge in the first and second centuries because you have more people literate, not high literacy, but wanting to engage in that book culture because that's the thing to do. And do you think that the destruction of the temple in 70 AD also may have been one of the main reasons that pushed the gospel writers to be uh, Greco-Roman-like in style. In what respect? See, I can ask you a follow-up. Um, what do you mean Greco-Roman in style? 
with the fall. Let me know. rephrase my question. Yeah. Um, could the destruction of the temple in 70 AD have been at least part of the reason that caused the gospel writers to embrace the Greco-Roman literary context? I see. Um, I think that the gospel writers, this was not only the medium that a lot of people are writing in at the time for the reasons I just talked about. Um, I won't belabor that. Um, but I think that, you know, and it's also the way that they're going to circulate because more people know Koine Greek than anything else. I think that war was a major source of disruption. I mean, obviously, but also um, I think it is for me, if I'm just sort of, um, you know, and I get to speculate again on these podcasts a little more, although I, I would be willing to put this in print, I think. And I did have a piece on Q that we talked about um, and a previous visit where I basically say this. I think when that war happened, what I have to imagine is this, you know, when you read Paul does not care much about the historical Jesus at all. Um, keeps talking about the risen Jesus. Uh, this is where you get Christ. You know, Christ wasn't Jesus's last name. <laughs> it means anointed one. He's the Messiah. Um, so he keeps talking about the risen Christ and about Christ and what's going to happen. It's that promise of what's to come. You know, the Jewish people have been occupied. Not all the Gentiles are happy uh, with their situation under the Roman Empire. The word is often, uh, that's often used as archon. Uh, archon is like the rulers of this world. If you're outside of Judaism and you're hearing that there's a Messiah that has resurrected, that has defeated death, that is coming back, maybe you want to be on the side of that. And so Paul has that kind of offering and he keeps promising it's going to come any minute. Uh, if you read Paul's letters, you know, his quote unquote theology kind of changes because the years go by and people keep asking what's going on. Um, you know, like you said, TikTok, like Jesus is coming back any minute. Where is he? Um, I actually was talking about this with my students yesterday um, in my death and dying class. And uh, I think I always use Bob. And so I said, you know, you get these letters between Paul and these groups that he's writing to where they're like, Bob died. You said Jesus was coming back. Like, what's going to happen to Bob? And Paul has to answer this. As time goes on, he starts to say, you know, like, well, we have to act right to make Jesus come back. Act now on earth the way that we're going to act in the afterlife or in God's kingdom, and then we'll be worthy for him to come back. Or he has a variety of other kinds of strategies that he puts forward. But over and over again, it's that promise of there's going to be this con this conflict with the archons, with the earthly rulers. This means Rome. And Jesus will marshal his heavenly army. The Jewish Messiah is supposed to be a warrior. He is going, read 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, this is all there. He's going to come back with this heavenly army. He's going to vanquish them. And then we will all be in the image of this. He calls him like a starry man. We're going to all be in that image because we will receive his spirit. We will get these, what he calls spiritual bodies, pneumatic bodies. We're never going to be sick. We're never going to die. And everyone else is out, <laughs> right? So again, if you're a Gentile, non-Jew, this is probably why you might be interested in joining this movement because you don't want to be left in the dust when this cataclysmic event happens. When that Jewish war happens, I have to think that that seemed like the moment, right? The Romans are marching in. They're sick of it, like all the conflict in Judea. Uh, they're sick of the conflict in Jerusalem and they follow their playbook. They march into the capital. They destroy the temple. They loot it. They kill everybody. Anybody they don't kill, they create prisoners of war and enslave them. I mean, this is this was awful. Um, I mean, that's an understatement. Um, and, you know, this huge rupture, not only for the Jewish people, but for Rome, for the reasons I was talking about earlier. And Jesus didn't come back. I think at that point, you see not only the seismic shift politically, socially, um, for all the reasons we're talking about, but you see that shift in the literature. So you go from Paul writing these letters, promising something that then doesn't come. And we don't even know what happens to Paul. Where does he go? We don't know. But after that, you get these gospels that sort of go back over this guy's life, Jesus. And then with Acts of the Apostles, Paul too, but goes back over, what did this guy say? <laughs> what did he tell us was going to happen? How are we supposed to live our lives? Why did this happen to us? Um, you know, what is the significance of his crucifixion? How can we have faith in this, right? Um, 
all of that, I think, takes place after that war. And then back to some of the other questions, you know, that we've had in this hour of why would anybody else be interested in this? Well, why was anybody listening to Paul? You know, the the promise, um, the imagery, the um, sacred books, you know, all of that is there. Uh, and it's replicated in the Gospels, but again, in this new key that I think reflects the disruption of that war or, you know, the the extent to which that war and the destruction of that temple created this huge rupture. And the other thing you get from Jesus beyond everything else, incorporating, you know, the Greco-Roman philosophy, referring back to these holy books, engaging the literature of the age to make it readable, interesting, engaging. Um, the other thing you get there is uh, while the temple is referenced, you know, Jesus at 12 year, years old goes to the temple because it's set in a period before the temple destruction. You don't get a Jesus saying, and then you have to go to the temple to make your dedication. You don't have to go to the temple to do X, Y, and Z. The kind of, we could even call it Judaism if we don't think that Christianity exists yet in the late first century, that it's more of a second century phenomenon. This is what someone like Bill Arnall has argued. But when you get uh, the gospels, you get Jewish teachings and a perspective on the world from that Judean perspective through Jesus as a teacher type that does not require the temple, right? The temple is gone at this point. And so he is presenting a way to understand Jewish scripture and to live your life that no longer is centered on that temple cult. And so that to me is also the big reveal, right, of the gospels to tell that they are post temple and the effect that that temple destruction had um, on the entire scene, <laughs> I guess you could say. Um, and I think there's an argument you could even make that you get Christianity because of that destruction of the temple. Larry Harris, thank you for your super chat. I appreciate it. And with that being said, thank you for joining me today, Professor Walsh. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate it. It's always fun. Thanks for entertaining my random thoughts. And thanks for your great questions, too. And check out the course. You're welcome. And thank you for joining me. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.